continue to look at this letter from Paul to the Colossians, we begin to see how Paul was encouraging this new Christian church to have strong foundations. His message was simple. As Ian told us a fortnight ago, Paul advised them from his own experience to focus on what was required to grow the church. And last week, Steve helped us to see how by focusing on the good news of the gospel, we grow and change and recognise that it's all about accepting God's grace. So today, I'm going to talk about us truly understanding what it means to be a Christ-centred community full of Christ-centred people. One question you might have is whether Claire will rebelliously have a four-point sermon like Ian, or whether she will take the line and stick with three. Oh, well, here goes. Today, instead of points, I'm going to ask three questions. What do we, do we mean when we talk about being Christ-centred? Who is the Son of God? And finally, why does it matter to us? So let's just recap for a moment, because the sequence of messages in this letter to the Colossians prompts questions. How does our worship of Jesus shape our outreach to our friends and our neighbours? How does our praise of Jesus shape the way that we live our lives as a church community? And when I say live our lives, I mean describing the ways that we live out our fundamental beliefs. In other words, the culture of our church. And here's the great truth that every expert in organisational leadership will tell us. Culture eats strategy for lunch every single time. So it doesn't matter how promising the initiative or how creative the idea, if it isn't in sync with the culture of our community, it will be a ship that runs aground. And if the culture of our community isn't a kingdom culture, shaped by worship, centred on Jesus, then any strategies that we have won't matter anyway. Our neighbours, our non-church friends, our colleagues, they don't need to hear grand ideas and grand gestures. They don't need to be patronised or preached at. They need to see Jesus reflected in us, his people. We want to be known for our altruistic selves, our normal day-to-day -day best selves. Centres are important, you see. Every person and every community has a centre, an anchoring point. And thinking about this over the last couple of weeks, stirred my connection to, you guessed it, science. Got a science lesson coming, guys. Perhaps you, like me, have very fond memories of learning about such things as centripetal force, centre of gravity, even centre of mass, which is the whole premise of the weeble wobble that won't fall down. Not sure if anyone remembers them, they were a very important part of my childhood, I'm happy to know. But back to centripetal force, let's just think about that for a moment because I think it's really important to the message today. Centripetal force is the force pointing to the centre of a circle that keeps the things around it moving in a circular path. The magnitude of that force is pivotal for the trajectory of the object going around the edge. It's like a merry-go-round, the old-fashioned kind, where you're in a chair and it goes round and round and round, and as it does, you feel like you're flying, spinning and spinning, spinning, and as you're spinning, you kind of face outwards and fly away. And it's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. You feel it, the joy, the exhilaration, the acceleration, the exhilaration. But at the same time, you are secure knowing that you are suspended to the stronghold in the middle. And it allows you to follow that set path, extending outwards and away. And what to get from this, to recognise that the centre of the circle is the most important. It's the strength of the centre that makes it important. Now, you might not believe me because I know most of you know that I'm a scientist at heart, but I do love to read as well. And I really enjoyed English literature A-level. And when I did it many moons ago, 
Um, one of the modules we studied was World War I and World War II poetry. And when I was thinking about the notion of centre, it sent my mind to the famous lines from William Butler Yeats's poem called The Second Coming, written just after the bloody carnage of World War I. Yeats wrote this, Turning and turning in the widening gyro, the falcon cannot hear the falconer, things fall apart, the centre cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loose and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, whilst the worst are full of passionate intensity. Yeats saw clearly what happens when communities and societies revolve around a centre that's faulty, corrupt and unable to sustain. Paul calls these unstable centres, thrones, dominions, rulers and powers in our Colossians reading this morning. Rather than holding things like the falcon in their proper orbit, these centres loose chaos and the things in their orbit spin wildly out of control. The poem sounds eerily contemporary. Without a strong centripetal force, the journey round and round and round is unsustainable. For many weeks and months, and I think probably years, everybody in here has probably thought at some point or another, the world has gone mad. Madness and chaos are the inevitable result when life is ordered around a distorted, flawed centre. But in our Colossians passage, Paul offers a breathtaking portrait of the true centre that holds all of life together. If we just take a moment to think back to what we've learned from Paul's letter to the Col uh, Colossians so far, he opens with a prayer, and even though he has not actually met the people, he thanks them for their enthusiastic and fruitful reception of the gospel. He then asks God to fill them with wisdom and spiritual understanding. He wants more for them than just mere knowledge. He wants their minds and their hearts and their wills and their imaginations to be shaped by the Spirit of God. He wants them to lead lives that are worthy of the Lord, pleasing to God, growing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with the mighty power of God, and filled with endurance and patience and joy and gratitude. Paul envisions for them a life that is beautiful and good and filled with purpose. And at the end of his prayer, he grounds both his gratitude and his petition to the huge work that God has already done for them. He reminds them, God liberated you. God forgave you. And notice the sequence. After describing the kind of people he prays for the Colossians to become, he then immediately tells them, eyes on Jesus. Both their current reality, like us, they're already members of God's family and citizens of the kingdom, and their process of becoming are anchored in the person and the work of the Son. So what was true for the Colossians is equally true for us. He wants us to apply it right here, right now. Place your eyes on Jesus. So our second question which Paul answers in the passage is, who is the Son? Remember, he's offering this to a group of people who are already identifying as Jesus' people. In the middle of a pagan culture, they're surrounded by it, just like we are today. Paul asks this question, who is the Son, by painting a breathtaking picture, describing the Son's identity in relationship to creation and to humanity, particularly to the church. He shows us three things to help us identify the Son. The relationship between the Son and the Father, the scope or reach of the Son's work, and deeply comforting results of what God has already done through the Son. In verse 15, Paul makes the astonishing claim that the Son is the image of the invisible God. And this echoes Genesis chapter 1 from the creation story. Let us make humankind in our image. 
The word implies more than just a mere representation of one thing by another. It implies a shared essence, a common reality between the Father and the Son. What Paul is actually saying is that the Son, the human Jesus, makes the character and the nature of the invisible Father visible to human eyes. And John says it this way, we read this morning, no one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father who has made him known. And just in case the Colossians don't get it, Paul specifies in verse 19, in the Son, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Everything that is God is present in the Son. And if that isn't amazing enough, Paul later on in his letters to the Corinthians and the Ephesians says, believers, that's you and I, are the image of the Son and the fullness of Christ. So you see, as the Son makes the Father visible to us, we, we make Jesus visible to the world. Let's just pause for a moment and consider that at the heart of the universe, at the centre of all reality, is a relationship. The scientific community, in their elusive search for the theory of everything, won't find it looking through a microscope or a telescope, but through looking at the face of Jesus. There is no set path, no safety in the spin without that central force. There has to be something in the middle. And the strength of that centre empowers and equals the force that can point outwards. So we can make Jesus visible to the world. The second element is the claim about the scope of the Son's work. Every time Paul mentions heaven and earth, he's using the Jewish way of talking about everything that is in existence, things visible and invisible. It's all created by him, for him, through him. And he uses two verbs to highlight the impact of God's work through the Son. The first is hold together. Through the Son, God has built coherence, utter goodness, and indescribable beauty. Every corner of the cosmos, from its deepest layers to its farthest reaches, is penetrated by the creating and the recreating work of the Son. In Him, all things hold together. He's the anchor point of it all. And unlike the false and fallible creature that centres in Yeats's poem, this centre, this centripetal force, does say, hold strong. The other verb that Paul uses is reconcile. Through the cross of Jesus, utter goodness and indescribable beauty are also available to each and every human being. To reconcile means to bring back into a right relationship that which was separated by a conflict. In his own body, the son took sin, the conflict and the barrier that had kept human beings separated from God. And through his own blood, he made a way for peace and restoration between humanity and God. So finally, my third question, why does any of this matter? Why does it matter who the son is and what God's done through him? What does Paul's letter have to do with us? It matters because we are also invited into the relationship at the heart of the universe. The intimacy between the Father and the Son opens to make space for us to join into that eternal love story. We've already been reconciled to God. That's a done deal. We already feel that centripetal force because we are set in the right relationship with him. And because of that, we are holy and blameless and irreproachable. And that's both a present reality and an ongoing work of the Spirit within us. Christ's work on the cross wasn't just for the moment of our death. We've already been transferred from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. And the days and the weeks and the months that we're living now, those are the dress rehearsal for the face-to-face -face of eternity. Jesus has already given us everything that we need for eternity, 
And he is constantly equipping us with the ability to live in accordance with his promise now. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is at work now, remaking our characters, freeing us from the corruptive effects of sin. And at the same time, we can be fellow laborers in God's mission of reconciliation. We are living the text. As he did the Colossians, Paul encourages us. He says, continue securely established and steadfast in faith without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you've heard. So, so what do we need to do? Well, we, each of us here, need to pray for our own context. We might need to recognise when we've been revolving around a centre that can't hold. We might feel encouraged because in the true centre, all things hold together. And we might feel that stability, that constant force keeping us on the right path. We basically need, though, to make a boldly honest assessment of our centre. Is Jesus the anchor point around which our priorities, our decisions, our values, our practices revolve? Do we acknowledge him as our centre in everything that we do and say and choose? Are we experiencing already the security of being held together by Jesus even when we're in the midst of distress or loss or change? Or have we allowed ourselves to be moved left or right of that centre by flawed and disgraced rulers and authorities? Are we influenced by other forces that are perhaps taking a central role in shaping us? We have to be really honest with ourselves. If we, turn, if we are tuned to the central force of Jesus, then let us just thank God who holds everything together. And if we recognise that our centre might have shifted, let us reconcile our hearts and minds to the Son by him, through him, and for him all things have been made. Let us recognise and be glad that we can enjoy the journey spinning round and round on the merry-go-round of life with the security of knowing that we are bound to the invisible centripetal force of Jesus and he's got a strong hold. How blessed we are to have Jesus the Son as our centre. And because of this incredible relationship with Jesus, we know that wonders have not ceased, that possibilities not yet dreamed of will happen, and that we can point ourselves to the world outwards with hope ever present, even when chaos surrounds us. Amen.